Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. It's your weekly dose of techno lust. And today I have a special guest who is afraid of channel hopping. It's Dark Matter. Dark Matter, dude! Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for coming down to the new studio. Why are you so terrified of channel hopping? <laughs> you just can't have enough wireless cards. You've got to be on every single channel at the exact same time. That's the only way. Mm. Things are getting too busy now. There's too much information that's just floating around in the airwaves. we got to watch all of it at the same time. Yeah, at the same time. So I feel like, I feel like there's something between us, Dark Matter. <laughs> well, what, it what all exactly happened at ShmooCon, right? Yeah, it was, yeah. A, it was at ShmooCon with the whole idea of, what would it look like if we listened to every channel at the same time? Well, you know, uh, Shannon and I tried this years and years ago with 802.11b or g or something uh, on 2.4 gigahertz. We stuffed a bunch of alphas in a, uh, in a Hello Kitty backpack <laughs> and crashed the USB bus, uh, <laughs> but said, hey, that was fun. You took it a little further. A little bit, thanks to your help, of course. So what exactly uh, is in this rig and what is it called? So this is, of course, hashtag Wi-Fi cactus. Of course. Uh, it's 25 uh, pineapple tetras, uh, yours truly. <laughs> uh, 25 of these guys, and each of them has two radios, so it's 50 total channels, and they're all communicating back through switches over Ethernet to a Intel Nook. So it's basically taking all the data, listening on all those channels simultaneously, and then pushing that information, storing it into single PCAP files, on the Nook for later analysis. Okay, so now we're gonna dial it back and kind of like explain it like we're five. Mm. Essentially, uh, what is the issue with traditional like Wi-Fi sniffing uh, with one radio? So right now, most wireless setups that you see, you have multiple access points uh, as you walk around. And that means that there's tons of different channels. And if you have one, you're only gonna be able to hear that one channel. But guess what? There's a ton more devices around you. How are we going to listen to those? So traditionally, you use a method called channel hopping. So it switches from channel to channel. So it goes channel 1, channel 6, channel 11. But people get creative and put things on different channels, like 2, 4, 1. Who's crazy enough to put something on channel 1 or 52? Right, so just in the realms of, just to simplify it, just in the realms of 2.4 gigahertz land, yep. there's 14 channels if you count Japan. Yeah, and so <laughs> in the US, you, 12. Right, and so if you were to only uh, listen to, if you were trying to listen to all of them, you could only ever get one fourteenth of the conversation at any given time. So you could like right. listen for one second here and then one second there and one second here. But for the one second that you're listening here, you can't hear what's happening over there. Right. And what happens is the data becomes fragmented. You lose that piece of information. So how do you solve that? I mean, clearly with brute force. Or, I mean, you could just have one radio on one channel and yeah. just ignore everything else. But what's the fun in that? What is the fun in that? Well, it sounds like you're, you're having a lot of fun. Walk me through, uh, on an individual level, what is each pineapple doing here? Okay, so each individual unit is running, thanks to Kismet, huge shout out to Kismet, the Kismet Project. Dude, it's Dragorn running, is killing yeah, it with yeah, this. Yeah, Dragorn, thanks buddy. Uh, it's running a, the Kismet uh, remote client. And what the remote client does is it communicates to the wireless adapters, the two of them. And it takes that information and packages it into Ethernet and pushes it back to the Nook. But it doesn't push it just back so that like I have to manage it or do something inside of the Linux system on there. It's running Ubuntu. But uh, it actually pushes it back to a Kismet session. Mm. And so then we get that data in a new like GUI, like HTML5, like gorgeous like layout. We can look through tables and see data in real time. So we're watching all that data stream to us all in real time. So that's what's happening on each of those individual units. Right, whereas, you know, if you were to just be like, oh, well, I can see the airwaves with something like, you know, Aircrack Suite, the, the Airmon, yep. uh, plug in, you know, 50 radios, <laughs> it's, that's a, not an experience like this. <laughs> Let's switch over to this, because this sure. is sexy. I mean, <laughs> this, uh, so this is the new Kismet, and yeah, that's a beautiful html -y. HTML5 kind of. And it has, you know, searchability, so we can look for, you know, different things in the environment just in the search box, so we can type in, like, I wonder what a 001337 MAC address <laughs> is. Uh, uh, that, that would be a MAC address that Hack5 <laughs> has uh, procured <laughs> through saying, uh, yeah, we want that one. I, I don't know anything about this. But, uh, you know, just that quick, I'm searching through data, and this has been on for a minute, um, and we can actually go quickly and just see you know, how much data that we've, whoops, wrong screen, that we've uh, started to see. And we're up to about 800 megs of RAM right now 
of just devices in our proximity uh, with a total count of uh, approximately, or excuse me, 800 devices with approximately 400 megs of RAM being used to see that, uh, to keep track of that data. This, so, is, this becomes like a big data issue. So there's two aspects here I want to ask you about. First yeah. of all, you know, uh, on the hardware side, and then uh, second of all, on the software side, because ultimately you're going to end up with what, multiple PCAPs, or how does that even work? But walk me through the hardware first, because now that I understand that there's Kismet running on each pineapple, and they're all communicating back over Ethernet to, to, to the Nook, man, that's gotta be one powerful Nook. What's, what's in there? Well, and, and I wanted to kind of get the best of both worlds. What is the most amount of power that you can get in the smallest form factor you can get? And so um, I've dealt with some Intel projects in the past, I uh, had some previous projects with them, and then also I've looked at some ARM stuff. But honestly, the Nook just made the most amount of sense because A, it's got NVMe, so you've got crazy fast uh, hard drive write speeds. Right. Uh, so Can we pause on that yeah. one for a second? Because sure. that was the one where I'm like trying to do the math. I'm like, wait a second, hang on. If every channel, in fact, switch back to here, look at the across the bottom. If every channel were saturated simultaneously and you're looking at 50 different channels across the bottom there and you can kind of see them move in real time as different, you know, the traffic is happening on mm -hmm. different places here. Um, I, it, it occurred to me like, hey, theoretically, you could, you could like saturate the bus, you could saturate your write speed. Like if this was just like a spinny disk, the thing would fall over if it was just like a regular SATA drive. Right, you're gonna be bandwidth re restricted there because you've only got you know 150 megabytes per second transfer. So this is a Samsung NVMe and that thing is like blazing at like 1.5 gigabytes per second on sequential re uh, writes. So you don't and even need a NAS. Yeah, no, at all. And that was my whole idea with this is like how can I pack as much power into you know, small spaces. And NVMe technology was, you know, new within like the last year or two. And uh, it's more and more affordable. So it's like, yeah, of course I'm gonna throw it in here. Plus the Nook's running an i5. Uh, so I'm getting dual core with four threads. So I'm getting plenty there. And it's got, um, I believe it's 16 gigs of RAM is what I've got in there right now. So I've got enough RAM, because as you see, I'm already chewing up 800 megs just on devices, just in, and, on, on, and that's the and, data and inside just, of here. So explain to me, that, that brings up the software. So we're just, that's just in the RAM, and so that's being held in Kismet, just ephemerally, so you can pull up this stuff that you just did a, like, uh, it looked like a, you know, I'm assuming a SQL query on the back end for you to be able to pull that out of the, the yeah, database? so Dragon, he's done a great job with this and he's basically created a temporary database and he's done a bunch of custom coding to it to where you can actually even run your own APIs into it and your own requests with Python and be able to pull all sorts of queries and different information that you want directly out of the system. That's so sick. yeah, it's awesome. He's doing amazing work like, and it's open source. Like it doesn't get any better than that. Like right? it's fantastic. Uh, so it's really neat to see. Um, but basically we can go through here, we can do a quick analysis of devices. Like I just picked one at random, so I don't know who it is. So we might have to blur, I don't know. Nah, I think it, <laughs> but, it should be fine, it's a 2 uh, device. And it just tells us where it saw it on the, free, on the spectrum, how much data packets that it saw, if there's LLC packets, there are management frames rather. And we just get a really good meta analysis of what's going on with that device. So if you're troubleshooting or you're having issues and you want to look at specific devices, it's super quick to be able to pull this up. Plus, I mean, we get the advantage of seeing both the APs and the clients. We get to see their different types of information they're sending out, whether they're you know doing beacons, looking for APs, uh, or it just whatever they're doing. We're able to see it in the full conversation. Yeah, people are using encryption. We won't be able to see past that. Sure, sure. Right. But, but we can but see everything up to that point. But you're showing that with something as simple as an i5 Nook with just a couple of hundred megs of RAM, uh, you can see the live data of what's actually going through the air. And that's huge. What I'm really curious about then is, you know, you were saying, you know, you take this to conferences, you wear this on your back, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous. Come to that in a sec. But, um, you're capturing all of that data for further analysis later. How do you get that data out of all of these? So right now, uh, my number one strategy is I write T-Shark scripts. So T-Shark is just a, uh, the command line version of Wireshark essentially. It uses the exact same syntax. So I'll go through and I'll write something custom up that I'm looking for, maybe specific SSIDs or some sort of query that I wanna do and I'll do it that way. And then I've usually been pushing it to a CSV uh, file uh, because databases can deal with CSVs easy enough. Right, right. And then I'll push that into SQL Server. And then I start doing all the gymnastics in SQL Server. So that sounds like a but, lot of work and is crazy. And, and where do you actually get all of that data out of? Because you've got 50 different interfaces that are all being networked as virtual interfaces. You showed me, it's really cute. It's like Tetra, One, 
WLAN or wh wh where was that again? That yeah, right so here. Cool. Yeah. So I've gone through and named uh, all of the individual Tetra devices. Tetra 24 WLAN 0. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, that's pretty insane. So does that mean that you end up with like 50 different PCAPs that you then need to like multiplex back together into one single database? Well, thankfully, the way that Dregorn has set this up, and it all goes to one PCAP file, uh, it does segment after a certain size because it gets unruly. If you start dealing with hundreds of megs of PCAPs, like it's completely unruly. You don't want to be dealing with that. It completely brings all of your querying to a crawl. So you can set up an increment based on how many packets that you capture. So I usually get to like sub a gig is what I usually go for. But I've <laughs> in learning that lesson, I've done as big as 40 gig packets. PCAP no joke. So tell, so tell me about this. How big is this drive in here, the NVMe drive? So got? I had a 512 gigabyte in it when I took it to DEF CON, but I didn't fill it. So you uh, didn't. I needed to. You're at DEF CON. There's like so much in the air going on there. I, in fact, I'm wondering how long until the whole thing is just full. <laughs> like how, how much can you capture? Uh, it's, it really just depends on, you know, the, the busyness of the environment because, you know, if you don't have a lot of people communicating, then you're not going to see a lot of data. Um, but then the other big thing is, you know, are you actually capturing the data and then recording it? Because we had some issues where uh, we had software crashes. We would have, you know, some issues with Tetras. We've been going through, you know, just trying to make sure that all the equipment's working. Like, getting one thing to work is easy. Right, right, and then scaling. But then, yeah, scale it to 25, and then you start running into all sorts of weird issues. Uh, you power issues, you know, your, your rig physically is pushing a reset button on something. Mm. You know what I mean? You don't realize it, right? Because you've got, you know, all these constraints that you're adding into this situation. Right, and you had to actually custom machine these parts. <laughs> right, and it was never meant to be in this, this sort of This doesn't situation. look like something you're gonna just pull off Thingiverse. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. We'll have to see. Maybe we'll open the design. So mm. to be continued. Yeah. <laughs> no joke. That's, well, it's so exciting to see like where the rubber meets the road on this thing. But you were saying you don't actually fill the drive at DEF CON. So well, and I think part of that is I mean we saw a crap ton of devices. Like there was forty gigs, uh, forty or fifty gigs of data is what I ended up capturing I mean, still there. A ton of data. And that was only during my demo labs. And I only did demo labs. Well, and the times I was walking around. So my battery life when I was walking around on battery was about an hour to two hours, uh, I think. And uh, then my demo labs, I did two demo labs okay. for four hours. So it wasn't like I had it on 24 seven. So if you so, were to actually like install this on a premises and actually try to record every day worth of traffic, you, you, you would really be filling NASA's full of Discs, right? Well, and that get, gets us to the next thing. You know, we gotta we gotta overcome some of the other bottlenecks. So like right now, I'm using 10 100 switches. Yeah. So like, and I need so to we'll, I need to upgrade that. And then uh, t tell me when you've got all of that data because you're storing everything, not just the management frames or not just you know the frames, but without the actual payload. You're you've got the whole datagram, everything. You could reconstruct and replay the Wi-Fi as if you were just like enjoying DEF CON again, <laughs> except w with less booze. Right? <laughs> yeah, you absolutely could. And I've actually thought about that, like to troll people, what if I just started replaying, you know, some wireless, <laughs> like, I don't know. So look for that in the future. So. Oh my God, you could record the CTF. <laughs> right. And then replay the CTF. <laughs> oh man, no, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so what? So uh, before we wrap up, the most I, what I want to know is what's the most interesting thing that you found combing through the data after you've pulled it into SQL. Probably the most interesting thing is like what people are doing on networks and like. Probably the most surprising was that how many people are actually using encryption now. So oh. as far as at conferences and, and different places, it, it, the numbers are a lot higher than you would expect. So you go through the data, you start coming through, you start looking through Wireshark, and it's like, boom, so much encryption. Um, and, and, and that's great. That's yeah, awesome. That's what we want to see, the, the, where we want the industry to go. Right. But at the same time, another thing is like, I also look, and there's a lot that's not encrypted. And you go to other places, like I went to conferences in Romania called Def Camp, and like there was a lack of encryption. Whoa. So, and like I've gone to a bunch of airports, and I've gone to a bunch of different places, and there is a lack of airports. You wear this at an airport? I haven't worn it at an airport, <laughs> but it's definitely been through airports. Okay, yeah, that's right. And you do actually have a younger brother of this, too. Yes, yeah, so I've got uh, the Tactilus, mm -hmm. <laughs> the uh, tactical version. So how many, uh, how many pineapples is that? Four. Okay, so the suitcase size. Yeah, uh, yeah, backpack size. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so that it gets pretty hot, though, keeping all of these in a little backpack, so. 
No joke. Man, Dark Matter, I'm always amazed at what you're doing. Uh, if you guys are not following Dark Matter on Twitter, you need to be at Dark Matter uh, in Leet Speak, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the E. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then where's your blog? Where are you hosting all of the other data on this? Uh, palshack.org. I mean, palshack.org. Awesome. Okay, cool. Is there any other uh, big thing projects you're working on that you want to talk about or? Uh, I've just got a whole bunch of ideas like percolating right now. Uh, looking at AC, revisiting AC because a project I did two years ago. I did some 802.11 AC stuff, and uh, I want to revisit that obviously because that's the next stage. And um, yeah, there's just a lot of things in the wireless right now that I want to get after. So, and I've got more free time to work on them, so I'm pretty excited. So. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thanks if, for having uh, me. If you would like to, well, <laughs> find all of the show notes with links to all of the resources and things we've talked about today, hack5.org is the place to go. That's where you'll also find all of the rest of the shows. The new season of Metasploit Minute is out. Uh, Shannon is killing it with uh, Tech Thing and Threatwire, so be sure to check that out, as well as the link to our little store if you want to get yourself a pineapple or two or 25 as well. But seriously, this is just insane. Mainly mad props to Dark Matter. Uh, do you know what we say at the end of the show? I don't know if you've seen. Perhaps. Yeah, okay. Well, with that said, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Mike Spicer. You say it first. <laughs> Trust your techno Trust your techno That thing. That's what we say. <laughs> <laughs> Domain.com has all your website needs, from .com and .net domains to intuitive website builders, so you can take that first step in creating your online identity. Let me tell you, there's no domain extension like a .com or a .net, or if you want to brand yourself, Domain.com has over 300 domain extensions like .club and .space. These guys are huge fans of Hack5. They're affordable, reliable. We've been using them for years. They've got all the tools you need to share your ideas with the world. And because they're such big fans, they are hooking you up with 15% off their already affordable prices. So get domain names and web hosting and email, and just be sure to use that coupon code HAK5. So when you think domain names, think domain.com.